to be walking around the fort, just feel free to ask. I'll do my very best to answer them for you. Now, folks, I got some images I'm going to share with you as we're walking around, so stay close to me as we're at every stop. So now, if you come close to the mosaic there, you're going to see a little, get a little bit of a better idea of what we're going to be looking at as we're walking around. So, Charlesford was built between 1678 and 1682. And that's during the reign of this man here, Charles II in London. And as Ireland was a colony of Britain at the time, the fort is named after the English king. Now the fear in London was that their enemies, France or Spain or the Netherlands, would sail an army into Ireland, which would join with Irish rebels, and then go and attack Britain itself. So to stop this happening, the British army start to build what's known as star-shaped forts all along the south coast of Ireland. Now these forts, they're the cutting edge of technology at the time. Perfected in France by a man called Vauban, everyone else was copying his designs. And everywhere Europeans have gone to, they have brought this style of fort. So you see them all over the world. So in the US, you've got Ticonderoga, Sumter, McHenry, Castilla, San Marcos. You'll see them in San Juan in Puerto Rico, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, Wayne, Vietnam, Cape Town, South Africa. The Pentagon building in Washington, just a moderate tribute to the Starship Fort idea. And normally, well, that's how they're shaped, but here it's different. And that our architects have opened up our fort at the back so as to get even more cannons pointing out to sea. Now, you see that red navigation mark in the water there? Every ship that sails into the harbour must come between that and our walls. Now you can imagine, with 94 cannons here at any one time, well, the chances of anyone passing are fairly slim indeed. Now, making it even more difficult for an attacker, there is a second <coughs> fort, James Fort, on the other side of the river as well. Now, that's James Fort. It's a little older. <coughs> It's built between 1602 and 1604. There was another 46 cannon over there, and they had one extra defense. A cable, 19 inches there at the narrowest spot to stop any ship passing that wasn't supposed to be in here. It would have been suicide for anyone to try and attack and sail from the sea. No one was ever foolish enough to give it a shot. <laughs> now, Charlesford, it's a good size. We've got 12 acres inside of our walls. There's 20 acres if you include these out of the fence works. But it's only half finished. You can see on the architect's drawing just here. There is supposed to be a far bigger fort attached onto the ground just outside. Wow. However, it's not unusual for government projects to run over <laughs> It cost four times the sum it should have done. Almost £80,000 to build Charlesford. 1680s, this was a massive sum of money. You've got a question there. Um, my question is, is the cable still there? It's after rotting away over the centuries, I'm afraid. Now, Charlesford. Well, the reason everyone is building their forts in this shape is that with the star design, there is nowhere you can approach one of our walls without being seen and then fired off from two or three of these projecting points, these bastions, all at the same time. So what the star does, it allows the defenders to rain maximum firepower on any attacker. And when they built the fort, everything in front was cleared away. No shrubs or houses or anything for 600 yards. That's your killing ground. You're gonna see anyone coming. You got lots of time. You can gather your men, position them up on the walls, where you can now fight off any attack. The next set of defenses you saw coming in. It's these. 
the low zigzagging walls outside the gate. They're called the covered way and they work like World War I trenches. If your fort's under attack, the last thing you want to do is open your front gate. That's your weak spot. But, as the saying goes, the best form of defense is a good offense. And you gather your men. You send them out through small doors called sally ports. There's one here where it says Devil's Bastion, one over here where it says Charles. Those soldiers rush outside, take up firing position along these walls, literally taking the fight out to the enemy. Next, you have the moat. Now folks, I'm always curious, but what is the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word moat? Water. water. Everyone says water. You know why? Because Hollywood movies and Warner Brother cartoons have been lying to you for years. <laughs> the vast majority of moats are exactly what you see outside there. They're called dry moats. They've never had any water near them. And the earth from the moat is taken from here and it's packed in here between the outer and the inner wall of our fort. And this is why you can see grass growing on the tops of our walls. And the reason for that, it's really very simple. If you reinforce your stone wall with a bank of earth, the earth will work like the shock absorbers do in your car. It'll absorb the impact of the cannon fire and if the cannonball punches through the stone, all it does is sink into the earth, come to a dead stop, and the walls stay standing for much longer than they would otherwise. Now, Charleston was used by the British Army until 1922. During its history, it's only been attacked once. This happens in the year 1690, during what's known here in Ireland as the War of the Two Kings. It's when these two men, William of Orange and James II, are fighting to see which of them is going to be King of Britain. And all the fighting took place here in Ireland. Yeah, I've always thought that was incredibly generous of the two of them. <laughs> now, James has 1,200 men inside the fort. William sends 10,000 to attack. The attackers have multiple advantages, the biggest of which is they have the last engineer who surveyed the fort on their side. And he knows where all the strengths and the weaknesses are. And he knows that this section of the wall here, well, this was only ever supposed to be temporary before they built that bigger fort onto the front. And as it was temporary, they never put mortar on the stone. And I mean, the stone was loose, and almost all of it had fallen off in the bad weather of the previous winters. So, of course, that's where William's men target. For two weeks, they're attacking the walls. For the last three days, they bombard this one section of wall here. Firing between 60 and 80 cannonballs an hour for three days into that one week and stretch of wall. The rain just poured down, washed out all the earth from between the walls after each impact. And by the end of day three, the wall couldn't take the punishment any longer. It starts to collapse and the defenders are given a choice of surrender or die. And they decided Oh no, surrender, live and fight another day. <laughs> There's always one guy in every group who wants to die. I don't know. <laughs> this is the only time Charles Woods ever came under attack. As one of my colleagues likes to say, we have a 100% failure rate as a military fortification. <laughs> so now we're going to take a walk around. That's all the complicated stuff out of the way. We're going to head down around the corner to those buildings you see zigzagging along the lower wall. And when we're there, I'm going to tell you about life for the soldiers and their families in here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to be very careful.
from in the group? North Carolina. North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay. California. UK, right? Mm -hmm. Rhode Island. Rhode Island, Ohio. Texas. Texas. Washington. Washington, all right. San Diego. So, everyone so far from the US to the UK? Mm -hmm. Anywhere else? Germany. Germany, okay. No other nationalities amongst you? God, that makes my job so easy. <laughs> to remember the history of three countries, this is great. <laughs> Let's be honest, US history, it's kind of like a footnote to Western European history. <laughs> <laughs> much shorter. Yeah, much, much shorter. So now, before we go any further, I'm just going to quiz the smaller guys amongst the group here. What age do you think you had to be to become a soldier? 18. 18, okay. Anyone else? 13. 13, right. Uh, 10. 10, okay. <laughs> Anyone else want to take a guess? What was that? What age you had to be to become a soldier? 50. 50, right. I'll come up, I'll tell you the answer to that in a few moments' time. And secondly, deliberately aimed for the younger ones, but the older ones can guess too. How do you think there was women soldiers? They number out. Say no. Two. 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 Okay. That sounds very emphatic. We'll come back to that too. <laughs> But before we do, have a look at the buildings right behind you there. Because these are the infantry guards. And if you were a soldier in British Columbia at the time, there was 12 men in each of those rooms. No rags, you slept on straw. You only get blankets to keep you warm at night. The army was charging the men based on how much coal and firewood they were using at the time. You've done everything in your room. You cooked, ate, slept, drank, gambled, lived, died inside. And only six soldiers out of every 100 were allowed to get married. And the only thing given to a man and his wife for privacy was an extra blanket that you hung in a corner of the room that you shared with the other 11 men. Yes, people have no idea how lucky we are to live now. If life here was tough on the soldiers, well, it was much worse for their wives. Because soldiers' wives are only allowed onto army barracks if they work as nurses or as laundry maids. And even then, they only got half the ration of food a day the soldier got. The children were given a quarter of what the father was given to eat. Now, you were not paid much either. You got a shilling a day, the king's shilling, it's 12 pence. But from the money, you were being charged for your uniform, your equipment, your two meals in the day, and even your haircuts. And if you had to pay extra to feed your wife and your children, you were incredibly lucky to get anything left at the end of the day. And then there was discipline. Now, at its height, there was 25 capital crimes in the British Army. When you break any of these, you're court-martialed, they find you guilty, you're brought to the parade ground, and you're then executed by firing squad. This is for really serious crimes, so you think treason or murder. But really small things were punished with incredible severity. If you're caught stealing something and selling it to someone else, in English they say you flogged it because that is how you're punished in the army. They whip or flog you with what is known as a cat of nine tails. The small whip you see there, and it's got nine whip cords attached to it. And now I am going to turn this over to you again. I'm going to give you every one of you the opportunity to have a guess what you think the maximum sentence that man could receive was. How many times do you think they're going to hit him? 49. 40. Right. Okay. Any higher or lower bits? 100. 100. Okay. Anyone else? Trust me, go higher. We haven't actually hit minimum yet, so wow. let's go, let's be honest, go a bit higher. 200. 200 is the starting off point. 
That's basically the minimum punishment you could get regardless of your crime. So let's go a little higher again. 500. 500, slightly above average, but no more than that. It's still not near the maximum. Go higher again. 1,000. To give a man a thousand lashes took four <laughs> hours. And it is still not the maximum. Oh my goodness. 2,000. The maximum sentence was 1,800 lashes. Anything beyond 600 was considered to be a death sentence. And it's from fear of this punishment that we got some really strange phrases in the English language. So, you ever hear anyone say, the cat's caught your tongue? Mm -hmm. it's because when you're arrested, you say nothing for fear they'll flog you. Or there's not enough space in here to swing a cat. Because you don't do the punishments in the side rooms. You do them down on the parade ground in front of all the other soldiers where everyone gets to witness your shame. And to really add insult to injury, after they flog you, they then charge you for the use of the cat. <laughs> it's a half a day's pay if they've only got to use the one. But if they break that on you and they end up using the spares you see lying on the ground, that's a full day's pay out of your pocket. So now, they've all gone incredibly quiet on me. <laughs> Normally there's at least one member of the group going, why in the name of God would you want to join the army? And what surprises everyone is how much of the British army was Irish. It actually got to 42% of it at its very height in the 1830s. Now, there is many reasons for joining. But for most guys, it was simply poverty. Unemployment numbers here were incredibly high. I'm sure you've all heard of the Great Famine in Irish history. Mm -hmm. But it's just one famine here amongst many. You get a job where they feed you twice a day, pay you on a regular basis. Well, you take that over the chance of watching your kids die from hunger anytime. In 1847, the worst year of the famine, more Irishmen joined the British Army than England, Scotland and Wales combined. So now we come back to the other reasons for joining. The sons of the soldiers tended to follow in their father's footsteps. So, so far I've got 10, 14, 15 and 11 for managing for each other's guesses. Any other guesses before I go any further as to what age you joined the army? Very close. The youngest boy here in Charlesfort to sign up as a British Army soldier was a nine-year-old boy called William Wyatt. He starts off as a drummer and works his way through the ranks, but he is not the youngest soldier by any means. And if I remember it, I'll tell you about him when we go around the corner. Other reasons for joining? Well, you're all doing it at the moment. A little bit of foreign travel and adventure. Born well, poor then, you never left your hometown or village, so you want to see the world? The military was your only option. As soldiers throughout the centuries have always liked to say, join the army, meet new and interesting people from ancient and diverse cultures, and kill them. <laughs> I'm finding this the way they actually did the recruiting, which is called beating the drunk. And what you did is you had your men put on the finest uniform and then you stage a parade through the towns and the villages in the area. And during that parade you're going to encourage the locals to join in. And the parade will end up at the recruiting centre. Which was? Pub. Exactly. The biggest <laughs> pub in the town. And once you go inside, the sergeants are there. They're buying you drink all night long. Next morning, you wake up, you're hungover, the King Shillin, one day's pay had been slipped into your pocket, meaning you are now a soldier and you have signed an unlimited contract. You cannot leave unless you lose one of your limbs in battle or you got so old the army didn't want you anymore. <laughs> this way of recruiting was so effective, everyone else did the very same thing. Union Army adopts the fuse in the American Civil War and the French used it regularly. 
The longest serving soldier I have encountered so far was an Irish man called Simon Kelly. So we'll come back to that second question I asked you. Earlier on you were fairly emphatic. Yanni, you think there was women soldiers? No. Nope. No. Okay. Everyone's still emphatic. And wrong. There was. There wasn't many, but there certainly was a few. But the thing is, they had to pretend to be men. There's a number of famous cases. The most famous in the United States is a woman called Molly Pitcher who takes over her ca husband's cannon in one of the battles of the American Revolutionary War. When he gets shot, she continues firing. George Washington gives her a pension. In the UK, the two most famous women who joined the army are both Irish. One of them is a woman called Catherine Davis. Catherine's husband went out one night, got terribly drunk, ends up becoming a soldier. A few months later, Catherine gets a letter from him saying that he's serving in the army in the Netherlands. And she's not really happy about this. So she cuts her hair, puts on his clothes, and joins the army as well. She spends the next seven years fighting around Europe, hoping to find her husband. And when she does find him, he's with another woman. <laughs> it gets far weirder than this, folks. <laughs> During her time in the army, Catherine was wounded on four separate occasions. She was accused by a Dutch girl of being the father of her child. <laughs> which she said she was, so that everyone had definitely believed she was a man. And it's only after she shot on the fourth occasion that the doctor who examined her discovered that she was a woman. Which apparently came as a real surprise to the guys who shared the room with her. <gasps> But she's just one example of many, I'm afraid, women who disguise themselves as men in order to join the army. That's a little bit more common than people would like to imagine. So now, that is the ordinary men and women. Now we're going to talk about the officers and if anything will show you how different their life was, it's that photograph there, <laughs> taken in this room behind me here in 1895. Yes, the officers are considered to be a breed apart. You can see they're treated slightly better. You've got silver cutlery, there's crystal glasses, the finest of imported fruit, and what they tell me are rather expensive bottles of wine, port and sherry just there in the background. Now, the reason the officers are treated so well is throughout much of its history, about 50% of the British Army Officer Corps or from the aristocracy or the gentry. So think of Prince Harry in the UK. You finished your education and you're waiting to inherit your titles and your land and the army is still seen as a suitable job in the meantime. A survey of the British Army Officer Corps in 2008 revealed that 58% still came from expensively privately educated backgrounds. So it hasn't changed that dramatically. Now, you weren't promoted based on how good you are at your job. You're promoted based on how much money you have. Because you buy your way into the officer corps and you kept buying your way up the ranks. So it starts off as 400 pounds. It was a big sum of money at the time. And by the time you got your way to Colonel, you could have spent about 9,000 pounds officially. Unofficially, you're not the only one who wants to get promoted. So you bribe the man who's selling his commission. And some officers paid massive sums to get ahead. Folks, anyone of you have ever heard of the Charge of the Light Brigade or the old Tennyson poem, theirs is not the reason why, theirs is just to do and die. The man who led that charge is a man called Lord Cardigan. Cardigan spent 29,000 pounds in bribes just to get promoted. In modern money, that's over 3 million euros. And once you're in, your pay isn't that good. It won't even cover your mess bill or your bill for food. And now you must buy your uniforms, your equipment, your weapons, your horses. And as you're an officer and a gentleman, they expect you to travel in style. So those officers brought wardrobes chests of drawers, suites of furniture, baths, silverware, pets and servants all to war with them as well. 
it got to such an extent that in the 1860s, Britain's at war in Afghanistan, and one of the generals needs 60 camels to carry all his furniture to war with him. It's all about priorities, you see. <laughs> now, life as an officer, in peacetime, it wasn't so bad. You get your own room. You get to share that with your wife if you want. If the room isn't suitable, you'll rent out an apartment in town. The lady being normally from the upper class, she's going to spend her days doing needlework and setting up charities in town. Officer himself, 19th century peacetime, his work is finished at four. After that, he spent the rest of the evening playing billards, going out hunting, fishing, playing golf, inviting the local ladies up to the fort for a spot of tea and mm -hmm. flirtation, as in the invite to Miss Abrams just here. But mostly, mostly you spent your time drinking. <laughs> One of the officers in here, a man called William Dyot, wrote in his diary that himself and the other officers spent from the 10th of April to the 24th of May, 1786, on a drinking spree, complaining that they were drunk all the time, that it had ruined their health, they were flat broke, and they were looking forward to going to war so they could actually save some money. And that guy became a general. <laughs> But that is peacetime. And war, it's another story. An officer was, and still is, 20% more likely to be killed on the battlefield than any of the other ranks. And during World War I, a junior officer in the trenches on the front lines had no more than a six week life expectancy. Now I said earlier, I'd tell you about the youngest soldier. Well, because promotion until the 1870s was by purchase, as I said, buying your way in, there was a problems with that. And one of the problems was what's known as a premature purchase, where fathers would buy their sons their very first commission at a very, very young age. So the youngest soldier in the British Army was a young man called Percy Kirk, whose dad buys him his first commission as second lieutenant when he was only six months old. When Percy was six years old, he was already Captain Kirk. I love the fact that Captain Kirk is a six-year-old, boldly gone wherever he went before. And by the time Percy had already finished school, he was already Colonel of his regiment. So it's abuses like this that led to a change in the system where you couldn't actually buy your sons their first commission until they were at least 16, and then they had to spend so many years in each role before they moved up the ranks. Now, we're going to head around the corner we're going to go up to where the ordinary soldiers would live again. Do any of you want to go into one of the soldiers' rooms? Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay, that's what we'll do. So follow me.
So now, folks, this here is the size of your average soldier's room. And you can see from where the floorboards rest on the opposite wall there, it would be another two floors above us. As I said, officially, it's supposed to be 12 men sleeping in a room like this one here. Perhaps a family living in the corner, Jer, and the surgery room will have a large table, and you add all your meals off that. Those are the optimum conditions, in effect. Because during wartime, it could actually be much higher. A survey done in 1856 determined that some of these rooms had 16, sometimes 20 men sleeping in a room this size. Toilet facilities were pretty much non-existent. In all of our seven barracks in Britain and Ireland, all you had was a large bowl, it was called the chamber pot, it was left in the corner of the room, it was emptied out every morning, it was supposed to be washed out, it was then filled with water, and the soldiers were expected to wash themselves out of that container. Yes. Now you know, the next time anyone ever says to you things have never been worse, just how wrong they actually are. <laughs> the conclusion of the study said that the average prisoner in jail had more living space and better accommodations than the soldiers did in the barracks. So they finally realized things have to improve, so they put in baths and toilets and ventilation. They reduced the number of men in each of these rooms, and they gave all the married men and their families their own private rooms in the barracks. That's the zigzagging building we stopped at on the far side. Mm. But the biggest improvement of all, however, was in the hospitals. We walked past our one just a moment ago. For the first time ever, the British government starts hiring properly trained doctors to work as part of the army. Before that, each unit would hire their own surgeon. At the time, these men were commonly referred to as being barber surgeons. It was widely believed by the army soldiers that that was their previous profession. The fact that they supplemented their income by cutting the soldiers' hair did nothing to help change that perception. <laughs> now their medical knowledge was at best limited. And as a result, vastly more men died from diseases and infections than ever died from wounds in battle. I'll give you an example. You know what? I used the Navy today. Between 1793 and 1815, that's the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the War of 1812, the Royal Navy lost 104,000 men on active service. Of that, just over 5,600 died in battle. Slightly over 12,000 died as a result of shipwrecks. And the remaining 84,000 died from disease. And that is true of almost every war, right up and including World War I. Wow. And on that incredibly cheery note, we'll head out there and explain to you why the buildings are in the condition they're in today. So ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be our last stop now. After this, we're going to give you a few minutes to wander around, take your own photographs. Our tea rooms and our toilets are just around the corner there on the right. But before we get you set you free, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about modern history, especially here in Ireland. So now, after World War I, revolution broke out here in Ireland. As a number of Irish Republicans decide, they want to break away from the British Empire set up their own independent all-island republic here, leading to a bitterly fought war of independence between 1919 and 1921. And this war ends by an agreement called the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And that divides the island into two. Anything north of this black line is Northern Ireland, stays part of the UK. And the other 26 counties are given dominion status which is what Canada or Australia also had at the time. Dominion status meaning you can have your own laws, you can have your own army, you can raise your own flag, but the king or queen in London is still the head of your country. And not everyone in Ireland was happy with this. 
And now those who'd fought for independence split into two factions. Those willing to accept that treaty and those who totally reject it. Rejecting the treaty were a faction known as the Anti-Treaty IRA. Who said they're fighting for an all-island republic with no ties to any other government. They'll stay fighting until they get this. <coughs> and then there's those who accept the treaty. And they are known as the Free State Army. That Ireland has reached World War I and the War of Independence. It's time to end the fighting. Accept the treaty isn't perfect, but use it to gain more freedom in the future. Now the sad truth is that in almost every single country that's ever had to fight to gain independence during that war, the seeds are set for the civil war. And here was no different. The Free State Army start to win the battles. Having taken Cork, they marched to Kinsale. Where there's a small group of the anti-treatyites who know, well they can't defend here. So they decide they're going to make sure no one can use her after them. By filling all of these rooms with bales of hay and straw, covering everything in petrol, and then setting fire to the fort. Yeah. And they kept Charles for burning between the 10th and 12th of August, 1922. And that is why you're seeing the damage here today. Mm. It's known as scorched earth policy. It's a really common feature amongst wars during human history. So, if I'm recalling correctly, everyone said that from either the US, the UK, or Germany. Any other country while I'm here? So for those of you from the US, think of Sherman's March to see Quantrell's riders, Kit Carson's campaigns against the Navajo, or the way the U uh, Br U US British Army burnt down the White House during the War of 1812. UK, think of Boudicca burning London down to ground, William the Conqueror's hiring of the North Wing in 1069, where it took some of the northern counties centuries to recover. Any of you ever see the film Braveheart? William Wallace was hated in England. The reason why, in revenge for what Edward Longshanks had done in Scotland, Wallace burns down 812 villages in northern England. So it's a good example of how one man's hero is another man's villain. Cumberland in Scotland after the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion where he got the nickname Butcher Cumberland and trust me it wasn't for selling meat. Germany, you think of the destruction of towns of Marburg and other towns like that during the Thirty Years' War when the entire cities were set on fire by all the competing armies. For two, for, for more than three millennia, armies have been waging scorched earth during war. Two thousand years ago, a Roman historian, a man called Tacitus, described it. He said they create a desert and then they call it peace. <laughs> and from that moment onwards, Charlesworth here, it's just abandoned. It's left to fall down, but the only ones who used to come out here were the local school children. This was their playground. Until the 60s. When the last people who lived in here for any time at all moved in, they did not care for war. All that they're interested in is peace, love, Bob Dylan, and flower <laughs> We had a hippie coming down on the playground. If that isn't an ironic ending to a military bar, it's not By 1973, the hippies were gone. That is when the Office of Public Works took over, and the OPW is a government department dedicated towards the restoration and the preservation of historical sites like Charles Hill. From that moment on, starts restoring the building, putting the exhibitions here into place, and well, putting guides like me to work. So folks, that is officially the end of the tour, just to be really careful as you walk around, because it is uneven, it is very, very slippery. Again, I'm just going to ask, no one goes on tops of any of the walls, because you want to all get you back safe into your boat again afterwards. Any questions at all, please don't hesitate. You can ask me now or come in to us as you're leaving. We're only ever too happy to answer. Any of the younger ones want to listen to a ghost story, don't hesitate. Come up to me now, we'll do it to, we'll do it to you there. And on behalf of the OPW, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here today. I hope you enjoy your visit. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.